Hey there everybody, how's it going? Nice to see you again. So today, um, what I got for you is uh, some tips to get the best out of your Fuji camera. So I got a comment on my um, uh, video, why it's so hard to, to switch from Fuji. And uh, the person said that they had uh, just, I guess the gist of it is they just got a Sony camera, a full frame, and uh, the images are so much better. And the Fuji images were terrible in comparison. And I'm so glad I went to Sony because Fuji was just awful. An APS-C sucks, something to that effect. And um, it got me thinking like, uh, man, is that out of touch with reality? Because um, there, I mean, it, it flies in the face of common sense, right? There are so many photographers out there that are using Fuji cameras professionally and making fantastic images with those cameras. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't uh, great photographers making great work with Nikon, Canon, and Sony. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is, is that if somebody um, gets a Sony full frame camera and it's so much better than their Fuji cameras that they tried, uh, I don't think the fault's with Fuji, okay? Uh, and it, Fuji in particular, and that's the point and why I wanted to make this video. Because to a certain extent, um, a Canon, a Nikon, or a Sony full frame camera, you can pretty much handle any one of those cameras the same way and you're gonna get the same results. So if you go out with a Nikon ca full frame camera, you know, a Z system, or even to a, to a certain extent, the uh, uh, mirrorless, I mean, to the same extent, um, a non mirrorless camera, the, like a, a DSLR, a D850, for example, um, you go out with, a, a, you know, a Z72 and um, you get great work that you're happy with. And then for some reason you get a bug in your ear to go get a Sony or a Canon full frame camera, um, you can pretty much do the same thing and end up with great results, okay? There isn't much of a change in your workflow or, or how you approach it, etc., to uh, get the most out of it, okay? That is not true with Fuji. And so the, the number one tip, so I've got five tips for you, but the number one tip is use the right software. And, um, or, or the, uh, actually it's the converse of that. Don't use the wrong software if you wanna shoot Fuji. And the wrong software would be an Adobe product. It is what it is, okay? Um, Adobe just uh, has not catered to Fuji and they're not, they, they just don't care about Fuji. And uh, to, to, it's, it's, it's kind of like to the extent that uh, well, it's not kind of like it is to the extent that uh, Adobe doesn't even uh, like Photoshop and Lightroom. They don't even render Fuji files correctly on screen. They look soft. So you can go out and you can shoot great Fuji JPEGs that are tack sharp, bring them into Lightroom and they look soft in comparison to, uh, you know, a Nikon, a Canon or a, or a Sony. OK, so that's number one. Number two. Adobe has, has had problems sharpening uh, Fuji files, so they got the wormy effect, right? Um, the rumor has it that they fixed that, but the point is, is um, can, are there people out there using Adobe software to process their Fuji files and getting decent results? Yes, but they're doing special things. In particular, they're uh, demosaicing their raw files with a, a plugin. And the best plugin that I would use if I were using Adobe would be the DxO Pure Raw 3. And they might be up to Pure Raw 4 now. I don't use that. I actually use DxO 6 that I bought. 7 is out now. The Photo Lab 6, uh, Photo Lab 7 is out now. And I don't really need, there's the upgrades to Photo Lab 7 aren't what I need right now. There's no need to spend that money on that. Um, I'll probably upgrade to Photo Lab 8 when it comes out next year, uh, but we'll see. But Photo Lab 6 is doing everything I needed to do. But most importantly, uh, DxO Photo Lab 6 is uh, rendering or, or uh, processing my raw files to their fullest extent. Okay, and that's important. And it's also 
showing me the images, the JPEGs on my screen in their full glory, okay? Which is something that, and now maybe Adobe's fixed this, maybe they haven't. You know, I, as of a year or two ago, they had not fixed it. And so, I mean, anything can happen, right? And I might, and I'm not up on the times with what Adobe's doing. But the point that I'm making is, is, you know, if you're not willing to use a different software than uh, Photoshop or Lightroom, maybe Fuji isn't the camera system for you, okay? Hey, I'm just being honest, all right? That's the way I see it. So, uh, so you don't use the wrong software, and that would be an Adobe product. Um, it, it, subject to change. I mean, so Adobe could come up to speed. Uh, rumor has it they're working on stuff. People are figuring out how to sharpen stuff without getting the worms, etc. What, you know, if that's important, you know, what I'm trying to say is if you really must use an Adobe product with your Fuji camera, then figure out what other people are doing to make those products work. It's not plug and play. DxO Photo Lab 7 is, and um, um, if you're going to use uh, Lightroom, etc., then look into the plugins like. A pure raw three etc that kind of a thing also uh, uh capture one does a good job with fuji raw files and displaying fuji files etc uh iridient has uh i think uh, that's the name of the company has a uh, fuji raw processor uh luminar evidently does a decent job as well but i think the consensus is the best demosaicing for fuji raw files is dxo so that's tip number one. Tip number two is use good lenses, okay? Now, to a certain extent, all of the Fuji system lenses are really excellent, but some are better than others, okay? And there is some sample variation. When they went to the 40 megapixel sensor, which is the equivalent of a 90 megapixel full frame sensor. And before anyone makes the comment, no, it isn't, it's 60 megapixels. Uh, you got to do the math properly on that. It's very easy to fall into the trap of taking uh, 40 megapixels, multiplying it by 1.5 times and coming up with 60 megapixels. But that's not correct, okay? Because it's a two-dimensional... Um, it's a two-dimensional equation that we're looking at. It's not a linear equation. And so you have to take the number of pixels on the height and the number of pixels on the length and multiply each of those by 1.5. So 1.5 times the number of pixels on the length, 1.5, I'm sorry, 1.5 times the number of pixels on the length, 1.5 times the number of pixels on the height, and then multiply those two things together to get the equivalent, right? And so that's about 90 megapixels, all right? When you're shooting the 40 megapixel sensor, like the important thing to understand there is your lenses that, are, that Fuji doesn't claim are optimized for the 40 megapixel sensor are, will still be sharper on the 40 megapixel sensor than they would be on the 26 megapixel sensor. For example, let's say you have a 18 to 55, 28 to f4 Fuji kit lens, okay? And let's say you have a great copy of that lens. And let's say that that lens resolves about 32 megapixels worth of detail. Well, on the 26 megapixel cameras, you're throwing away four megapixels, six megapixels. <laughs> <laughs> That's the new math. You're throwing away six megapixels worth of detail because the sensor is only good up to 26. On the 40 megapixel sensor, you will get 32 megapixels worth of detail that that lens can resolve. So it'll be six megapixels better, okay? That's just an example, and I'm just making that up. I don't know what the uh, 18 to 55 is really capable of, okay? I don't have a good copy of that lens. So, um, and you test your lenses, take them out, shoot with them, make sure they're sharp in the corners, etc. On my 18 to 55 kit lens, it's not a stellar copy. Thomas Heaton didn't get a stellar copy of that lens either. Some people have, because there are reviews out there of that lens where it is really spectacular. And, you know, that's not what I got. My lens is really sharp in a square, or even out to a four by five crop, but 
when I shoot the two thirds crop, the edges are soft. It is what it is, but it's still a usable lens and it's usable for video and I've got it. But for example, uh, my 16 to 55 is absolutely 40 megapixels worth of sharpness, pretty much all over the place. And that's what you're paying for. And that's why it's heavy and that's why it's expensive. And that's why it's big. Okay. Also, plus the fact that it's a 2.8 lens, but it's a pro level lens and it's sharp everywhere, mostly to a certain, maybe the extreme corners, but yeah, you know, nothing's absolutely perfect. Right. But it's darn, it's as close as you're going to get. Okay. Um, uh, my eight to my uh, 16 to 80 millimeter lens, I've got a good copy. It's not, it's not, Fuji doesn't say it's optimized for the 40 megapixel sensor, but it's a good copy and it's sharp enough and I really like it. Now my 16 to 55 is a little bit better. That's why I have both because they both kind of do different things for me. So um, my 70 to 300 uh, Fuji lens, I highly recommend that lens. It is absolutely up to the 40 megapixel standard. Love that lens. And surprisingly, I got a great copy of the 10 to 24 WR. It is up to snuff on the 40 megapixel sensor. Now, it is what it is, and I, I'm, I'm lucky, I, I'm happy. There are 10 to 24 copies of the WR that are that good. So it is what it is. Now, again, that's a lens that there might be some sample variation because um, some people have not been so happy with it. So my third tip is use proper technique, all right? You can get away with more stuff with a lower megapixel camera, all right, because you're not expecting it to be pin sharp everywhere, you know, at 200% when you're hand holding a 26 megapixel or 24 megapixel full frame camera, 26 megapixel APS-C, you know, when you're hand holding it and you're just snapping away, right? Okay, you, you, your expectations aren't that high. When you have a 40 megapixel X-T5 and you're hand holding it, I mean, you got, you got, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying you can't hand hold an X-T5, but if you're expecting to be able to see uh, ultimate resolution at 200% on your screen, I'm not 100% sure that's gonna work, right? Well, I know it's not, okay. So if, if, you, if you're making these comparisons, the limiting factor there is not the 40 megapixels or the 24 megapixels or the full frame or the APS-C. The limiting factor there is your technique, which there's nothing wrong with your technique if you're doing street photography, but there is something wrong with your technique if you're expecting to be able to look at those images at 200% on your screen and you're expecting both of them to be equal in quality. All right, okay. So um, what I'm saying there is, is if you have a super high resolution camera and you wanna get the most out of it, put it on a tripod, use a lower ISO, uh, use a great lens, watch your shutter speed, you know, that kind of thing. You know, watch, do everything you can to mitigate camera shake, et cetera, use proper technique. You're gonna get the most out of it using the best techniques, okay. This only applies, if, if, I'm not saying you always have to do that. And I, I, I'm, I'm not saying, you know, stifle your creativity in order to get the best, uh, uh, the ultimate resolution in your cameras. Uh, what I'm saying is, is if you're looking for that, don't think it's the camera's fault if you're using quick and dirty techniques to take quick and dirty photographs, which is totally legitimate if there's a reason to do that. Okay, but it's not if you're camera testing or comp A, B in cameras, right? Okay. Number four, don't over-process your images. Don't, um, don't expose for the highlights and underexpose the shadows by four stops and then lift them in post. That, that's, that's, in my opinion, and this is my opinion, that's poor technique. Okay, I, I would much rather bracket the exposures within seconds apart from each other and, you know, make one exposure for the shadows, make one exposure for the highlights, and then blend the images and software. I do consider that a legitimate technique for digital photography uh, and, and watch the saturation sliders and whatever. I'm a minimalist photographer anyway. So, um, uh, it, it, you know, uh, if you have a Fuji camera and you're saying, I'll fix it in post, like that might not be <laughs> the best camera system for you. Uh, Sony, Nikon, or Canon might, might make that a lot easier for you. But that's not the camera's fault. I mean, that's poor technique again. So 
there it is. Um, my opinion, okay, so don't take this as gospel and I'm not saying, you know, well, if you're doing that, that you're wrong. Uh, I'm just saying that's not my preferred method, okay. And, um, and I think you'll improve your images if you get your exposures right in camera and recognize when you need to bracket, etc. Um, don't rely on the software to fix your images that you could make better in the field. And tip number five, honestly, stop worrying about it, okay? Many, many, many photographers have made great images uh, with many professional photographers have made great images with Fuji APS-C cameras, with Micro Four Thirds cameras, with Sony full frame cameras, Sony APS-C cameras, Canon, Nikon. They're, they're, if you have a camera that was made in the last five years, a digital camera, you know, if you're not getting good images, it's your fault. It really is. All of these cameras are so spectacular. And, and the last point that I would make to really make you stop worrying is somebody said recently, which was interesting when the, when the uh, camera companies improve the APS-C sensors, you know, those improvements also carry over to the full frame sensors. They get better too. Yeah, but that's assuming that they were here and uh, the APS-C cameras go up like that and the full frame cameras go up the same amount. And that's not what's happening. It's not a linear progression lockstep together, okay? What has happened in the past five years, and I've seen it personally and experienced it personally, is um, the full tray cameras were better than the APS-C cameras, and then there were improvements, and the improvements, you know, the full frame cameras got a little bit better and the APS-C cameras got a lot better. And it, every time there's an improvement, that's what's been happening. They're getting closer and closer in terms of image quality. And we're at the point now where with proper technique, proper software and good lenses, honestly, I've tried, okay? <laughs> Going with a full frame camera over my Fujis is a sideways move in image quality. It's not, there's no real improvement, okay? Me personally, and I've referenced it many times um, Ian Worth has that fantastic video where he tested the $10,000 Canon R5 kit against his X-H2 with, his, with various lenses. It was a wash in print, okay? I've had the same experience. And my point is, is, you know, why spend double the money for bigger size, more weight? You know, and everybody says, oh, you get the professional APS-C lenses. They're, um, they're just as heavy and j just as big as the... Uh, as the full frame lenses. That, that's not true. All right. Um, maybe uh, we, with the 16 to 55 to eight, maybe, maybe not. All right. But a great example of that, which I always point out is the 70 to 300 Fuji lens, which is about 800 bucks. It weighs about a pound and it's an awesome lens. And if I wanted to do that in full frame, that would be a 100 to 300. Now the 70 to 300 Fuji lens is a full frame equivalent of a, one, of a 105 to 450 millimeter full frame lens, okay? A 100 to 400 millimeter Nikon is about 2,600 bucks and it weighs three pounds. So $2,600 and three pounds of weight, and it's bigger too, versus the uh, Fuji lens, which is one pound and it's 800 bucks. I mean, that's a no brainer right there. I mean, you, there, that's where you can really see the APS-C advantages and the Fuji advantage over full frame. So um, there it is. And uh, those are my tips for uh, getting the most out of your Fuji system. Uh, hopefully that's helpful to somebody. And all of the images in this video were taken with an X-T3 or an X-T5 or a X-H2. So, I mean, it's been my main camera system for the past five, six years now. And I've tried to move on to something else, to full frame, right? A full frame is supposed to be better, this, that, and the other thing. Personally, for, for, for my uses, I, it, to me, it would be a sideways move. And every time I've tried to get into it, I've always spent eight grand, sat there for... Uh, a couple of weeks and said, you know, I'm going nowhere with this. In some ways I went backwards. So that's been my experience and it is what it is. And I appreciate you watching. Like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. 
and we'll see you out there when the weather improves because it's been terrible out there and that's why I'm in my office tonight. So I've tried, I've gone out three or four times and every time, man, I, I had to beat a retreat. I was getting, I was just getting hammered with rain, sleet, snow, wind, 30 degree weather. I mean, it was awful. So anyway, that's enough whining and whinging. Weather's gonna improve and we'll see you out there taking some pictures. Have a great one. Thanks for watching. Bye.